Hey. Oh boy, what do we have going on on screen? First up, hello, Jeff. <laughs> and hello, Jeff. You look good. You look good. You are incredibly young for your age. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know what else to do, and he's here. All right, now you have to come up off screen to make my shirt back. Time for our How to Human show. Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us back here in Code It Live. We got an excellent topic here today: accessibility. But Todd, why don't you tell us who you are, what you do? Well, uh, my name is Todd Libby. I am actually retired now, as of not too long ago about a week good for you. ago but i was a web developer uh accessibility engineer web engineer it all started way back when when the term webmaster mm -hmm. was was around and you you made your first site and you were a webmaster so a webmaster that was a thing maybe still is a thing is this still a thing? I feel like it probably yeah, is, yeah. although I don't hear it thrown around as much. It used to definitely feel like a very important title. You'll have to talk to our webmaster about that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Todd, what um, drew you into accessibility? Why include everyone? Well, uh, the first reason it being um, accessibility is a right, not a privilege. Um, and accessibility is, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's all inclusive. It includes everybody. So, um, that, and I got into it, friends, family members who are disabled and I was like, I was their voice when I advocated for accessibility. Uh, normally I don't speak for everybody, um, when it comes to accessibility, those are the people I speak for first, you know, and then um, from there, you know, helping out the uh, disabled community, the accessibility community uh, in that way. So that's how I got into it, seeing the looks of frustration on people's faces when they tried to access something digitally and they just, for whatever reason, um, it wasn't accessible to them whether it was they couldn't see the color on the screen when, a, you know, something was using uh, color that they needed to interact with and it caused confusion or um, with, you know, other things. Uh, and there's a lot of it. So I'm trying to think of one instance. Um, somebody was on a computer and they were trying to access a site to buy something. They couldn't access it through their assistive technology because it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't work with, the site wouldn't work with their access, uh, assistive technology. So, um, you know, the and, and that's an example where you're lit literally losing out a customer at a sale because- Yeah, doesn't yeah. And there's a huge, yeah. <laughs> there's a huge disposable income number that goes along with the uh, disabled community and what they're willing to spend. Yeah. Yeah. So there are so many nuances to this, but I'm going to drop something that I came across the other day, just so I don't forget. Um, so, you know, the big tech companies, they have, you know, gotten much better uh, in, in trying to, you know, include everyone. Uh, this is a thing that Microsoft puts together every year, and they've been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, and it's very, very good. So it's called the Ability Summit, and it talks about every nuance uh, of accessibility you can think of. Uh, wonderful speakers all around and just a really, you know, ton of good content. So that's coming up actually in like, you know, a couple of weeks. So if folks want to just tune in, um, that's, that's a great, great resource. All right. Is so that, sorry, uh, is, is that a thing that requires registration? Do people need to register up front for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's all, you know, virtual. So, you know, and then they will make sure everyone, you know, can access it in however they, they you know. Uh, prefer. Um, so there are a lot of nuances, right, Todd, to accessibility. It's not one thing. So can you walk us through the different things that one has to keep in mind in, in modern times? Yeah. So, you know, disability is not just blind, deaf, or, you know, in a wheelchair. 
uh, you know, disability is migraine headaches. Uh, disability could be tremors, Parkinson's, um, you know, all sorts of different visual deficiencies when it comes to color blindness or, you know, you can't see the red blue spectrum, that sort of thing. Astigmatism. So, you know, your, your glasses, your eyeglasses you wear, those are assistive technology. I had told that to a CEO once and he nearly fell out of his chair because he said to me, we don't have disabled users. And I said, you're wrong. <laughs> so, you know, it once, and it's kind of how I picked, you know, from working in, in accessibility, once you start learning about accessibility and practicing accessibility, it takes you to different areas, just even outside of digital. So like going to events, for instance, or going to the grocery store. So it's these little things that, and the awareness is there. So, um, So chat room has been uh, vocal. Let's um, sign up people on the spot on the internet, because why not? Our good friend, Solomon Burnham is here. Hello, hello, my friend. Another big advocate for accessibility. So uh, Chris, we are signing you up here on the spot to come and talk about this more. You you need to. You'll um, get a so, calendar invite shortly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as one does. Um, now, this is a good trend here. Fool Schnabel was talking about how uh, he is in Norway, uh, that if you make certain things, uh, you know, mandatory, it makes everyone just sit up and, and do the right thing. So you cannot sell to the state or the feds unless uh, you have accessibility to thought in. And, yeah. and, and that's, uh, that's a quite a, you know, big thing. Uh, and, you know, like you said, like when you think about accessibility in not just um, just the plain terms, like you mentioned, like eyeglasses, and, and you would think about like temporary disabilities, like that includes everybody now who is like, what is a special case? We are all needing assistive things to mm -hmm. get on with what we are trying to do. Yeah. And it goes to, you know, if, you know, you've broken your hand or if you have a child in your lap, you're trying to send an email and the phone's ringing. You know, there is a temporary disability because, you know, you have your hands full. Um, you know, with me, um, you know, when I get migraine headaches, sometimes they get so bad that I have to stop what I'm doing and I have to go lay down, dark room, take my take the meds that I use to combat those migraines. So, um you know, those temporary, you know, situational disabilities, they're not on the mind of a lot of people a lot of time unless, you know, something clicks or, you know, unless you're aware of, you know, listening to people like like uh, Chris, like Homer, uh, like go on and on and on um, in, their, in their talks that they do at, at conferences so um then you have hidden disabilities too you know adhd um neurodiverse uh mm -hmm. folks so you know it it is a very widely encompassing um umbrella that accessibility covers um making those uh you know Make, making things accessible for people it should be a priority. And I saw a great uh, post the other day that said all organizations should have a director of accessibility. 
And I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think, uh, I think businesses and organizations would improve, you know, improve and, and benefit from having somebody that's in charge of accessibility. I think we'd see a lot less lawsuits too, but. That'd be a very difficult job, Todd. Um, it would, you know, I mean, valuable for sure. Cause I, you said something, um, several minutes ago when I, I think all, when you were first introducing yourself and talking about how your, uh, how you got into this space and some stuff you experienced with family and, and you made a comment that, you, you know, you don't speak for everybody, but, and, and I think that's really an important topic. And, and a similar theme has been said in when we've talked about, when we've talked about disabilities on the show, we've talked about uh, DEI on the show, like uh, no one, you can't speak for everybody. There's no way you could, if you tried to speak for everybody, you would fail. Um, and and so I wonder, like, if you're in that role, so let's say you are a director of accessibility in a company, which is really a, a great idea, right? And and if, if you're in that spot, how do you balance that and figure out how, like, you will always have somebody telling you that you should be representative of, you know, name accessible or disability here that you had just had not thought of. And, and, and there will be times where it's like, well, we, there are going to be times when you can do the best you can, but you aren't going to be able to accommodate every single possible disability for every single kind of technology, because sometimes it just mm -hmm. like something doesn't mesh. So right. how do you figure out, I guess I'm asking, how do you figure out when and where to draw a line and how do you figure out like, always be trying to be better, always be trying to improve, always be try, always try to be more accessible. But when do you know, how can you at least know that, that you are doing everything you can? Is that, or is that a thing? Yeah. Uh, you know, nothing digitally anyways is a hundred percent accessible and you always will have an edge case where somebody will need a, you know, will will need something, you know, and you just can't, it, it, you can't do it for, for them for whatever reason. Maybe it might be the technology. Maybe it might be, you know, what, whatever the case may be. Um, digitally, 100% accessibility, just it doesn't happen. Um, you do the best you can. You make the effort. You show that you make the effort. That's the, the first and most important step is making that effort. If more companies made that effort and showed people that, you know, especially the disabled community, we made an effort here that would get them much more respect than just, you know, sweeping it under the rug or, you know, just totally dismissing it. So making the effort, you know, that's the key. That makes a lot of sense. I could sense. see, sorry, Sam, I did, like every, oh, at least once, at least once per show, I have to have a situation where Sam starts to talk and I just keep talking. <laughs> You're good. You're good. No, you go, Sam, because then I'll carry on with what I was thinking. No, you, you made some really good points in there, Todd. Um, and, and, and Nicole, you're, you're also being honest here. Uh, there, there are so many things um, that can be swept under the rug, like to your point, and we just don't even realize. And it's, you know, always wanting to do better and, you know, educating ourselves. Um, one quick example in the offline world, uh, you, you spoke about hidden disabilities. This was something I did not know until uh, recently. Um, do you know what the lanyards, the sunflower lanyards if you see somebody, um, you know, with a, a sunflower lanyard, that means they have a hidden disability. It might not be apparent, but it is something that uh, they're mm -hmm. carrying. And uh, like airline uh, crews are actually, you know, well trained uh, to come and help. And, you know, when we talk about our modern worlds where we, everybody is busy and we are running around through the airports and we take pride in how efficient we are and how quickly we can get things done. You stand in the middle of a busy airport during rush hour. It can be overwhelming. And all it takes is for one person to stop and say, hey, can I help you? It looks like you, you're slowing down. You could need some help. So it's not just the digital world, even in the you know, offline world, if we can just, you know, be a little bit aware of hidden disabilities. There is just you know, so much help. And I, I know Chris talks about this as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think there's probably a whole lot more people with hidden disabilities than there are with readily apparent disabilities. Um, or at least the sir feels that way uh, to me. Yeah. So. So, you know, Todd, um, 
just going back for a second now. Let's see, I, I I let Sam go first. See, <laughs> um, but going back for a second to this idea. So so sometimes because when I when I was asked about it's not when I say like where do you draw a line? I don't mean like where that wasn't like a well when's enough enough. That's not you know it's more like when do you know that you're doing enough? I like your point about like showing the effort is important. Um, I have had situations with with certain you know hidden disabilities of sorts that I deal with where like their their accessibility or lack of accessibility is an area that can be rife with with like gaslighting honestly right with individuals or organizations basically telling you that it's fine or telling you that like you know your situation I'm gonna pretend like I can be in your shoes for a second and tell you that the thing you're dealing with is really not that big of a deal or look we took care of it everything's fine mm -hmm. right there's a, you know what are you so upset about like there's there's a lot of room for that for for bad actors or even unintentionally bad actors mm -hmm. to to effectively I, maybe gaslighting is an overused term but it feels like gaslighting right to 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 delegitimize somebody else's real concerns um how do you because you're a, not only do you think about this and consult on this but you're a great accessibility advocate you and and, and chris and others homer you mentioned who's awesome like you're great advocates for this. So how do you handle it when you see it, when you recognize it and how can you, because this is a lesson for others who maybe watch this, who don't have the benefit of being uh, accessibility consultants or professionals, but still would like to advocate in a meaningful way. Like how do you recognize it and address it head on when you see that sort of thing happen? These days, it's a lot more difficult, I think, for people that, aren't, you know, in the accessibility space or they know nothing about accessibility or very little. Um, I guess it, if you see something, you know, use your best judgment. If you see something that's really, you know, glaring like, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an, of an example, but I can't right off the top of my head. An example of, you know, if you see something and it is pretty blatant that it's something that, you know, situation or, or something that is making something inaccessible and preventing accessibility from taking place to say something, you know, find someone to speak to about it. Um, you know, all the time you see on Twitter, well, not much these days, and I still call it Twitter. <laughs> so, um, so all I'll call it, yeah. Um, alt text with images, you know, people still, you know, using alt text for images helps, you know, people that use screen readers understand what's in the in the image, or it should. Um, so saying something about, it, hey, could you please use alt text with your images? Now, twenty five years, I've seen lots and lots of people advocate and this is one of the things that makes accessibility very hard and very tiring is the repetition of hey could you put all that text in your image or hey the contrast of that text is horrible can you please fix it most of the time it goes on you know it it falls on you know on people and they're very quiet about it Right. They're they don't want to they don't want to address it or whatever the case may be. It's not important to them. Uh, oh, here's a good here's a good example. Uh, when Rage Against the Machine reformed. Right. There was a video that went around and the video was, I guess, one of their first concerts. But they were flashing strobe lights in the background of the video that in turn could cause a seizure with somebody that suffer, that you know yeah. has is prone to seizures and i asked the poster of the video hey could you please post a content warning that may you know trigger somebody that ha has seizures or you know who who's you know deals with seizures or prone to seizures and I got this guy that jumped in and said, well, don't watch the video. That's the kind of dismissiveness we're talking about, or I'm talking about. Uh, 
<laughs> don't watch the video. Oh, well, it's easy for you to say, but I would like to enjoy the video. Right. Or, yes, or at the very least, uh, I'm right. I'd like to be able to watch the video in a perfect world at the very least. Like, okay, I wouldn't watch the video if you if there were at least a warning and I knew. Right. I don't want to find out I shouldn't have watched the video when I start seizing. Right. That's right. the wrong time to find out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, and you know what, Nicole, that's actually a good point, which is to say, like, deciding how to say this, the, we're talking, when, when, when it's sort of show the effort, are you really showing the effort if you just slap a warning on every single ride at a theme park? Like, no, you're not. You're covering your ass is what you're doing, right? You're making, like, at that point, it's it, probably no, like 80% of those rides wouldn't cause you a seizure. And there's not a reason to be concerned about it if you're epileptic, but in the, out of fear of being overly concerned, we're just going to slap it on everything. Well, that's not, that's not accessibility. That's, that is exclusion is what that is, right? That because we go from being accessible to saying like, in the interest of making sure that you don't come back and sue us or complain about us or post something negative on Yelp, we're just going to act like everything we hear is not here. Everything we do here is not for you just in case. So there, again, like, um, I, I think there's got to be some boundary, like real effort is trying to make the actual thing itself accessible wherever possible and understanding and providing viable alternatives when it's not possible and not just like putting a, a, a one size fits all solution, you know, or cover all over everything. That's not accessibility to me. Um, yeah, and- like when I was thinking, sorry, Sam, but what, like when I was thinking about uh, your talk about migraines, Todd, I, and I was thinking like, well, we like, we talk about trying to make everything um like you're specifically your migraines where you have to just step away from the screen and lay down mm-hmm. right? like sometimes the answer is like look if your work or the thing you're doing necessarily requires you to be sitting staring at a bright computer screen that's the only way to do your work right now like okay i can't i can't fix that like if you're a migraine and you can't be staring at a computer screen you you just can't like there's no way necessarily I, i'm not an expert here but like there may not be a way to suddenly turn your computer screen into something that you can use while you're experiencing the migraine so then mm-hmm. it becomes well, then your employer or the company you're working with needs to be accessible as an organization to simply be ready and willing to recognize your, your disability and say, that's all right. That's fine. When you need to step away, we understand you need to take a break and that's all right. And there's no issue. It's not that you're not in trouble because you walk away from your screen for half an hour or an hour or six hours or whatever it is. It's just as a fact that has to happen. Um, yeah, and, and this, you know, sorry, I was just going to mention one quick thing here, Todd, uh, like to what Chatroom is commenting and, and this problem about, you know, strobe lights and color mm. blindness, this is, this can become very acute when so much of it is generated by AI these days. And mm-hmm. it, it is amazing. Like if you just think about it, what, you know, Google Bard or, you know, uh, OpenAI is trying to do, you give it a text description and they generate a video for you. Like that is amazing stuff, but you don't know what's in it until you actually watch it. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the strobe, the, the, the strobe lights that could cause that could, that could trigger a migraine and it has with me. So that's why I brought that up with the AI. While I think AI could benefit and it is starting to, um, how it could benefit accessibility i don't think ai will be the answer because you're always going to need that human element um i think if done right and done with the disabled community in mind it could be great but i mean Tech doesn't have the best track record, to be honest with you, when it comes to accessibility and the disabled community. I mean, still, and I say this all the time at my talks, 99% of the internet is inaccessible in some fashion. Um, You know, maybe even 100%. So, I mean, AI, I'm kind of, you know, on the fence with that but if we just took you know 
five to ten minutes. And I discussed this with a with an event create uh, an event organizer recently. We just took five to ten minutes and said, "Okay, we're not going to touch upon everything, but how are we going to make things ex- as accessible as possible?" Like, and I know KCDC does this. I know a few other events that do this. They provide alternatives to people who don't drink, like myself. I shouldn't, and nobody else shouldn't feel like they're alone in a crowded room at an event because there's booze all over the place. Um, full yeah. disclosure, I am a alcoholic. So I ask events if there are, you know, are if there are any um, accommodations for people that don't drink. Now it could be you have someone like me who can't drink because they meet judges, attorneys, police, and all that other stuff, and I break out in a bad case of ha- bad case of handcuffs. But people who can't drink because of their religion, their culture or whatever it may be, personal belief, we should all try to make that attempt to say, you're well, everybody's welcome here. Um, you know, Nicole, you mentioned the parade, curb cuts on the sidewalks. When, you know, when you get to a crosswalk and you see those curb cuts that have the little ridges, the stuff there, that's, you know, so, you know, people who use a cane, blind people, can tell when the, you know, when the crosswalk is, is coming up and when the, the curb begins and ends. So accessibility can be everywhere. You just have to really look for it. Um, and you really have to, I mean, if it's not on your mind, you're not going to think about it. I mean, I talked to a developer who, didn't know anything about accessibility and he asked he said you know there are people that can't you know see this or or whatever interact with this because of a disability i said yeah so teaching that person about accessibility planting the seed making them more aware Hmm, I didn't know that. So uh, to, to your last point here, Todd, let's just say I, I am in charge of developing a new product, let's say digital. And I feel maybe I want to learn, but I feel overwhelmed with everything you're, you're telling me. Mm-hmm. There, there is vision, there is neurodiversity, there is hearing, there is you know general physical ability, and I feel overwhelmed. I am like, I cannot hit all the, you know, check marks. Um, so how about I not do anything at all? What are certain basic things that, you know, developers can use to make sure we are starting the journey to make things more accessible? Uh, you know, I would like, I would like to see developers who have this burning desire to learn react and view or angular or this or that javascript what have you whatever it may be i would really like them to have that same energy when it comes to learning about accessibility because i think you know five to ten minutes of just reading something a day in a week you're you know you're those those minutes add up um Asking the developer community, especially in the accessibility space, because there are disabled developers out there as well, 
um a lot of people may not realize that um you know, asking the people in the accessibility space questions on how can I make this more accessible or how can I make this accessible, period. So, um, just showing that initiative uh, is one thing. Um, do you, everything doesn't need a div. <laughs> I say that a lot. Uh, everything doesn't need a div. There's HTML5 out there. I'll just say that much. Um, you know, uh, here's another thing, and I, I'm trying to not be too specific, but in this case, I have to say this, like a button performs an action, a link takes you somewhere and a div is a container. Please use them wisely because for every audit that I was doing that I would go down, you know, 27 layers deep. And it was all divs. That's why I have gray hair. So <laughs> you, you, you can see this is, you know, uh, hitting a chord here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's and, just and the, the learning. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and to like uh, Chris's point, like, yes, there is a lot, but and have the intent to start and there is tooling to help you out every mm -hmm. step of the way. Like yeah. there is Lighthouse, there is accessibility checkers every step of the way. So if you care, and maybe that's where, you know, the regulations may be coming a little bit. Like if you have to work with the federal government, you need to have these standards, then you'll be forced to care. And mm -hmm. there is tooling that, you know, helps us do better. But so Sam, you asked how you get, you know, how, how someone gets started or what Todd would like to see. And Todd, you said you'd love to see just more developers have a passion and just have the drive and want to learn. Mm -hmm. more about it but like how so that i agree with that but like how do you how do we give effect to that right like i mean one way is uh i guess you know if you want to be involved in this movie like actually just speak about it. you know though it's difficult is i think some people like me i'd be afraid to really speak up about accessibility because i'm not an expert in this space i just don't know enough i can recognize sometimes when, when something's obviously not accessible but i certainly don't have the expertise i'm i'm not really even a developer anymore Mm -hmm. You could argue I never was, uh, but like I'm, I'm certainly not anymore, and I'm not a front end guy or designer or any of that, and I'm, and I don't have expertise there, so I'd be afraid to say something and say something wrong. But on the other hand, like, you know, using using a, I'm sorry, Nicole, but using KCDC as an example, I was like the last of the of the other three of us to even bring it up today, okay? But using it as an example, um, we've had a good number of speakers who go up and give talks about their disabilities, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it's not even about KCDC, okay? It's like other conferences do this, obviously, as well. Um, get, I think a very powerful way for people to learn about accessibility is to actually hear from it from people who live it. Um, we've had speakers who are, you know, somewhere you know, along the autism spectrum who have given gotten up and given talks at our conference about that experience and what that is like and, um, in a professional setting. We've had people who have uh, both both apparent or visible and and hidden disabilities speak about those and when you put those people directly on a stage and give them the uh, give them the platform to speak about their experiences it can be very powerful mm -hmm. but it still doesn't mean I'm like you still have to have the people who want to walk into those rooms and listen to those speakers now we've had some pretty good luck where, we, where those get big audiences at our events but that may not always be the case so like how else other than other than just filling the airwaves with it um we really didn't make it the whole show though, because it's come up several times. I just haven't said it, Nicole. <laughs> now, now I have, is, but is is this a problem? Um, uh, how about PCDC? Like, uh, no, never a problem, Sam. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> for somebody learning, Todd, I mean, do you see this like for entry level developers or somebody who is self taught? Is, is this a problem that we don't fill up the airwaves? That there, I mean, when you're learning HTML5, when you're learning React Angular, you don't get to see a mention of this. Absolutely. Great there role. has been, you know, a large, um, how do I put this? There's been no education up until recently for accessibility. Maybe you would hear at a boot camp, five minutes of using alt text on your images, and that's it. That That is all either... Um, the instructors don't know or they don't offer the curriculum now 
you see it more often these days um, with sites like Marcy Sutton's testingaccessibility.com or Sarah Soydan's uh, practical accessibility course. The W3C has an introductory course. There are more courses out there now um, that offer the education. So it's been very, we've had a very bad lack of education because it used just when I started doing this, it used to be just people spreading the word, speakers going to conferences, you know, talking about accessibility and that's it. Nothing in, you know, like, like, you know, um, Chris mentioned college doesn't teach it universities overseas i don't think many did you well yeah i don't think many did but there's a lot more now that teach it um boot camps um you know there's been no higher education period or a very troubling lack thereof um but now more and more you see more people especially people that create content and who do accessibility they're starting to offer these courses now. So, and and there's great education out there now. That would be an interesting place, probably also a frustrating place for advocacy for the individual trying to do it. But it would be interesting just to take on that part of advocacy, like just getting out there and talking to both higher education, like actual colleges and universities and programs like Corinna was talking about a minute ago, just like for career changers who go to code camps and actually just getting to the organizers or the chairs of departments and talk to them about it as someone who's an expert that maybe that can be your retirement. I know you don't have any desire to like do that anymore, but like, but it'd be interesting, right? Just, just, just go around and just be an advocate and, and talk to programs and say, this is important. Like here are the resources. It's sort of the, it's the, it's the leading the horse to water thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like how do you make people care? Well, you can only make them care by letting them know it matters as often as possible. Because like, even I'll say, I'm not trying to call it. Oh gosh, just wait the chat room. So active. Um, yeah, yeah. But like Thindle here, like, I'm not trying to call you out, but like, I was thinking about this actually, I'm, I'm putting this here because it needs to become a thing that you think about all the time. I, I will tell you what I've been feeling guilty about for the last, oh, 41 minutes and seven seconds or so is that like, not quite that long, but like even while this was actually going on and while we were talking, I went over to Twitter and posted something uh, about like, cause I posted a picture. I always try to think of like the four of us on a screen. And then I, I took a picture when I was standing over there while my son was sitting here. So I put them up side by side. And you know what I didn't do is I didn't put no, all of on those images. Yeah. yeah, Chris is gonna come after you. <laughs> I know. So there's but, I mean, and, he, and he should, like I should be called out for that cause, cause you have to get in the habit. Like you, sorry, I'll take Fendel's comment off here, but like, you got to get in the habit of doing those things all the time yeah. so they become a second nature because otherwise just like the curb cuts and things like you know what that you're right that accessibility stuff is there all the time and if you are able-bodied you don't even know like literally you walk on those things you don't even notice they're there and it's not because you don't care it's because you don't you aren't the person who needs them so you don't notice them and so if you don't get into the habit of being aware of those things and recognizing them when you see them then you never get into the habit of using them for the benefit of other people right yeah so Todd, let me ask you this, this, this comment, uh, something along these lines, because like Nepal was talking about, like when you're trying to drive a business or you're just trying to ship something, get something done under the clock, do you consider that, that as a luxury as compared to what if this came down as a business need? Like you showcase the business need of supporting accessibility and how it's good for the software that you're trying to build. And then it becomes part and parcel of your learning. When you present to a C-suite that aspect coming from money and how it'll accessibility will benefit the organization financially, their ears perk up and their eyes widen. And that's basically the strategy I had going into the last few years of when I advocated. And to touch on Je Jeff's um, what you spoke about the advocacy part that'll always be there with me you know i may not want to do auditing anymore because it makes my head spin and right i miss <laughs> but um that advocacy part will always be there so the the coming from a legal standpoint it doesn't scare c-suites anymore because they can just say uh oh, we'll pass off the legal we'll let them take care of it and then they don't have to worry about that 
you know, the and, they, and they'll settle it. Yeah. And it'll settle just like that, like you said. Um, but I mean, the, the business case is harder to ignore because like, you're showing the business dollars. case is very hard. And that's a talk that I was giving a couple of years ago was the business case behind it. And I was it a couple of years ago at KCDC. I gave that talk. Um, mm-hmm. Once you get that support from the top, that all falls down like a waterfall to the bottom of the organization and then there's your culture of accessibility and then developers won't be as cranky because you're saving them time they don't have to go back and fix things you know if accessibility is implemented even at the concept phase even before the design phase so much easier so much smoother on your developers your designers your pms whoever it's not an you afterthought. Yeah, you don't have to go back and change things unless you know you've gone all the way through the project. The project, you know, it's it's live, you know, it's out there, something changes, then you have to go back and fix that. Sure, that's gonna happen, but you don't have to go back and fix things you thought weren't ever going to need to be fixed again when you do accessibility from the start. So it's the business. Yes. It's the business side of things, the financial side of things that really gets a a C-suite and their attention. So so I'm going to, so on that topic, it's interesting because I I think I agree with everything you're saying and I will go one further, one step further and say, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because I think what often happens with people Look, there's two sides of this, right? There's the organizations that need to enable and empower accessible technologies and accessible products, accessible services. And then there are the advocates, people like you and Chris and Homer, and hopefully more and more people. Corinna, you know, you know thanks for your contributions to the chat today. Um, like, and I have seen a lot of people, um, even, I mean, at, at times you, right? And I understand the feeling, right? Where, where it's the people who are advocates, you're advocates because you're passionate about the thing. You care about the thing. And so like when it has to turn into conversations like, oh, screw companies, they're just greedy. And like, if you turn into a negative, like, well, they're going to be greedy, so appeal to their pocketbook. Because, you know, the thing to remember, and maybe I said this because of my like first career as like a business lawyer, right? But like the, the fact is that for those C-suite executives and for the companies, they, their only obligation is to increase, is to maximize shareholder value. That's actually their job. They can be sued if they don't do that. Mm-hmm. Right. They have fiduciary obligations, especially in publicly traded companies. They have fiduciary obligations to maximize the value of the organization, to, whether that means maximizing profit, maximizing share price, whatever. So that's not a bad thing. And so I think for advocates to recognize that, like, the reason that r- resonates is because that actually is their job. Their job is to do that. So instead of treating that as like a, well, we're going to go talk to them because they're evil. No, they're just trying to do their job. And so meet them where they are and like use that then all of a sudden it becomes a friendly, productive conversation from both sides. Now you're having a positive conversation where you are promoting accessibility and you recognize that you are providing a positive story for that. Maybe it's not that they're bad people. You're giving them the, the, the weapons they need to fight for that fight for you from the executive C-suite because they can say with a straight face, we're going to do this because it will benefit our bottom line. It will increase our business. Um, that's a positive. That's a net positive for both sides. Yeah. Well, let me put it this way. 2020, I believe it was 2020. If you're, if you had a company, let's say you all owned a company, you sold something, whatever your favorite thing is, and you sold it worldwide. There is a three trillion dollar industry, for lack of a better term, with the disposable income from the disabled community. Three trillion dollars worldwide. Now, I don't know of any company that would want to lose out on a piece of $3 trillion. So that's the approach I usually took with somebody at the top was if you don't want a piece of that, you know, that's fine. That's your decision. And then you start seeing the gears clicking and moving and turning. And that's the seed that gets planted. I settled for one percent. Yeah, (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah I, think, I think like Todd, you began the story saying like you had somebody who wanted to buy something but just could not because the mm -hmm. website did not allow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're, you're you're literally missing out on business if you if you don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah and. I don't want to speak again. I don't want to speak for everybody in the disabled community, but usually I've seen and, and found that, you know, once you shut somebody out that has a disability, they will never go back to your website again. Mm -hmm. You've lost that customer. They will go elsewhere. So that's another thing to think about. And, you know, even if it's somebody like, you know, even if you're one developer, and you're like, ah, my company doesn't do it. And my company doesn't believe in it. Take what I call the Nike approach and just do it. Just start doing it yourself in your code. So maybe I, I wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, maybe, maybe more of a specific question, because I think we have talked about several aspects of uh, you know, accessibility. Uh, how do you feel about uh, supporting mental health um, as a part of accessibility? Like, how do you, you know, try to you know, reduce distractions for you know, anybody who has you know, autism, PTSD, any type of you know, mental thing that you know, is not letting them focus? And how, how can software be better? Provide a service for that for those people, first and foremost, whether that's anywhere from, hey, take 15 minutes and just decompress, go into a quiet room and decompress, or we have a number you can call, call this number, it's somebody that works with it, you know, with for the company that can provide you with something, you know, someone to talk to, you know something that will um, benefit that employee so you're not going to lose them. Um, I think mental health is so important. I mean, I have a talk that I wrote up about burnout because I've been burnt out. That's what really led me to where I am now is I was so burnt out and it has its toll. I've been in my head last night, yesterday, and it, you know, it, it is a grind, you know, trying to get people to just do the little things and you say, you make suggestions, you know, you make suggestions here and there of how people can end it. And they just, for whatever reason, whatever the, however they react, they just don't want to do it. They don't think about the bigger picture. You know, you know, um, Bradley, we're not shipping your computer just because it works on your computer doesn't mean it works on everybody's computer. So that's the kind of, you know, thing that if you provide your employees with an outlet to be able to, you know, speak freely and, and, you know, without fear of, you know, whatever the, somebody in the company will find out, you know, it's whatever the case may be. That's so important. Happy employees, you know, they make a happy business. Let's face it these days, you know, and when you have miserable employees, that affects a lot. It's like the ripple effect. You throw a rock in a, in a lake and then those ripples start forming and getting larger and larger. Yeah, so, no, that's, that's well said. Yeah. Because, I mean, it, it, like, to your point, uh, what you just said, like, happy employees create, you know, happier uh, things for everybody else to use, like Marcus was pointing out. Like, it's not just developers trying to make apps accessible. It's also on the reverse side. Like, when you are a developer and you need the right tools to be able to do your job, uh, and you also empathize more because you, you're going through that yourself. Yeah, and there's even guidelines with, you know, having accessible tooling. And, you know, while it's not set in stone, you have these things that people can use to create better experiences for everybody. I know it's hard in, in some areas, but, and it, it I mean, I guess, for instance, um, you know, I've, I've had 
conversations where it's like, well, I, I do Java and this, that, and the other thing. It's like, it's just still can be accessible. There's no, I mean, I had to make, when I was do, doing cold fusion work, for instance, I still, ha oh, and boy, oh boy, nice. didn't that wow. contribute to oh. the gray hair? <laughs> I still had to make things accessible and I could. And I just dated myself. You can carbon date me too. I mean, for real. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, hey, it's still around. So I, I'm still around. And I mean, so so is around. so is Cobalt, dude. Oh I mean, yeah. So I've done both of those. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't know where to go from that. Oh yeah. my word, Cobalt. I did Cobalt like two years of it almost. Oh, uh, I just can I say something by the way, Thindle? Um I guess I am going to put it up here. I I appreciate I appreciate you and the and the openness here in the chat talking about this. I to me PTSD is a great example of a of a of a hidden disability that I have no doubt impacts you in so many areas of your life. Mm -hmm. and that most people you interact with aren't ever going to see and it's a great example of like things that can happen in tech or in an app or like you made a comment about jump scares a couple a couple of spots earlier in the in the chat um that like you know in in media and all sorts of things that you know i don't know you i know sam does um i think sam does or you've met at some point right um that could just probably set you off in like all sorts of bad downward spirals and and that like the producer of that content or that app would have no idea they could even have that impact so that's a great example yep. so like when it comes to mental health because i think a lot of people like with me i mean i have a whole litany of problems um but i think a lot of the things that i deal with even if they're a little more severe than some others have to cope with they're they're well known and well established and they're the kind of things people think of when they think of mental health challenges and i think ptsd is probably one of those ones that doesn't necessarily cross people's minds that is that it probably really needs attention so thank yeah. you for that yep it is a lot of different different areas that even my research and my work in the w3c i'm a member of the w3c as an invited expert i use that term mm -hmm. loosely but invited expert uh invited or expert which term is loosely used? uh it might have been uninvited but i can't disclose that information but okay. <laughs> it, it, we, i was we, invited <laughs> <laughs> we mapped out for for one of our subgroups we mapped out over twelve thousand. Uh, user or functional needs. Now, without getting into user or functional wow. needs, wow, that's a lot, and that doesn't even cover everything. Yeah, there was no way we were going to cover everything because that would that. I want to retire. I, I wanted to retire soon. Yeah, I did it sooner than I thought, but I, I, you know, that that would take a long, long time. To do so look if you fixed one of those twelve thousand per day and addressed it you could you only have like another 33 years yeah i don't have that long i didn't have that long i <laughs> i'm running out of hair that isn't gray so i'm running out of hair periods so uh, i'm okay. starting to run out of hair yeah yeah <laughs> oh my gosh yeah uh, we, we can talk about this forever. Uh, and then yeah. Chatroom, thank you for being uh, so open, honest, and you know, contributing uh, to this discussion. It's been great today, the chat. Yeah. Like tons of stuff. Lots of people. Lots of, you know, several several new uh, new names and faces who maybe have been watching for some time but haven't chimed in on the chat. So it's been it's been great. So Todd, um, in the ideal world. Uh, Maybe you're, you know, you're looking ahead at what things could be done right post retirement. Like, what what's your wish list that the industry did right? You know, there is a lot to cover, but you know, and and we have the intent, we have the you know, willingness to learn. What's what's your wish list? Um. Wow, that's a good question. an internet that is more kind that is more tolerant 
that is less clustered with misinformation, disinformation, and um, companies that value their employees like they say they do and show that through action, not words or PR statements. Um, less, less firings, less layoffs, especially. Um, it, it, a, a more accessible um, internet and a more accessible culture tech yeah. aim, that. aim into that and, and yeah there is nothing more to be said yeah all right folks i think uh i think that's a show here uh, we have easily gone an hour we can go a lot more but uh to everybody's point here there's a lot of love here in the chat room but uh, I think I think Karina mentioned this. Todd, thank you for um, taking the time out uh, to come and do this, and thank you for everything you have done, That's right. you know, pre-retirement and everything that you're doing now to keep the work uh, going forward. Uh, you know, thank you for contributing to our awareness, and so we all learn how to do the right things. Well, thank you for having me. I I really had a good time today. That's it from us, folks. Uh, that's the show. Thank you, thank you so much, and we'll see you around on the next show. Be well. Bye-bye.